Unlike most other technical videos about cathode ray tubes, the radar room has decided to take the practical approach to explain a little about safely designing and building projects using one of these devices. As safety is of paramount importance when working with CRTs and high voltages, I think you'll agree this is the best slide to start things off. Obviously for those who feel their skills do not extend to working with very high voltages, there's plenty to learn here without picking up a soldering iron, so just enjoy the video. This drawing shows the fundamentals of a cathode ray tube. Ignoring specialist variants, there are essentially two types of CRT. The first being one that uses coils around the neck to deflect the electron beam on its way to the screen, thereby giving magnetic deflection. These coils are normally fixed to the neck in a carefully designed yoke assembly. The other main variant uses X and Y deflection plates for electrostatic deflection. Whilst the connections to most plates extend along the length of the tube to the base connector, along with the other internal electro connections, some come straight out of the side of the neck. As far as practicality of construction is concerned, unless A, you already have a matching yoke set for your coils or your tube, or have a practical requirement for magnetic deflection coils such as video monitor, then it's probably best to avoid this type of tube altogether and stick with the electrostatic deflection with its X and Y plates. For your interest, many, many years ago, I tried making myself a simple oscilloscope using a small tube and matching deflection coils. Well, yes, I made part of it, but the design did work after a fashion, but I soon gave up and bought myself an electrostatic tube to start again. Let's now look at typical electrostatic tube base connections. Straight away you may spot a possible area of confusion, namely, when is a grid not a grid? When it's an anode? Each manufacturer seems like choosing their own way of describing the electron gun assembly in their tubes. Some call them grids, some others call them anodes, with the remainder using both. The best way to approach this from a user's point of view is to take the nearest electrode to the cathode, call it the grid, then everything from there upwards to the deflection plates is an anode. Can't go much wrong with that. OK, it's probably best now, so we go and let's look at some real examples of CRTs. This is probably one of the largest tubes you're likely to meet up with. Um, this is six inches across at the face. It's quite a beast. Look at the size of it. This is in fact a CV966. It's a monochrome version of the one that's used in the G indicator and other similar pieces of equipment. Um, this takes 1.4 kilovolts on its final anode, but it does not have a final anode button. It comes out on the large connector at the back along with all the other connections. Um, what's good about this one is that you can actually see the X and Y plates quite clearly here. There and there. And as I say, it's, it's quite large. If you use one of these, it's great, but make sure you have the connector to go with it. Um, as it, I mean, theoretically, you could solder on your, your pins to it. Um, thing to note about these older screens is look at the shape of the screen itself. Is it bowl shaped? This I believe is because they couldn't make flat screens at that time. Therefore the modern CRTs you'll find all have a flat screen compared to this one. Here we have another tube that's very similar to the CV966 in size. But it is different, as you can see, in shape particularly. At the front, we actually have a flat screen as opposed to a bowl shaped one. Likewise, another difference is the fact we have the pins here halfway up the neck for the X and Y plates. They don't go down to the base. You can probably see either the X or the Y plates there inside. Base is quite different, but try and find a matching socket to go with it if you can. It makes your life a lot easier if you're going to build one of these in. This is an interesting tube. This is a CV1596. It is one of the first tubes that attempted to give a double beam to the trace using a beam splitter inside. Oops. There's still only one electron gun assembly, but so the splitter splits between gives you two traces basically, so it literally splits the electron beam in half. Um, this is once again quite a it's quite an old tube, so we do have the same rounded bowl here. Um, 
the base is similar to the, the Tektronix scope we just saw. Um, but as I say, once again, it, having the socket does help. This will run down to about 1100 volts and give a very nice trace. Um, great for projects again. Talking of double beam tubes, this one is by Etel. We have the data sheet on this and we're sure to find something to do with this sooner or later. You notice we have a completely flat screen, so it shows it's a modern tube. Likewise, interesting enough, if we look at the base, you'll see that actually two electron gun assemblers, I'm sure you can see that. And the, the plates, there's two pairs of plates, two sets of plates, should I say, because there's four in all. And the plates are coming out on these little pins you can see here. So there we go, it's a different a different approach again. The base is completely different, shows it's a modern valve. Um, so there we go. I say the problems with a tube like this is if you buy one, fine, but there's no point in buying it if you can't find the data on it. For anyone familiar with wartime radar sets, I think this one is going to be something that they will know. This is the VCR138A, which was used by many, many different pieces of equipment. Um, it's it, it's surprise has a surprisingly big base, and to considering that it's only a three and a quarter inch uh, screen at the front. These little indentations here appear to be. I think just simply to lock the the plates in position to keep it secure I believe I can't see any other purpose what they're for look carefully it might be possible to see you can see the air ministry crown on the side as well not much else to say about it it's it's a very good tube in our experience the display is not as sharp as a modern one I mean you can have a very nice bright display with one thousand volts across the final anode but it's it never seems to be able to, I mean we have about four of these and none of them seem to focus into a very very tight spot but hey it looks good they work well and there are a lot of them out there it's funny how they chose to use a very large base for that four volt heater again like the CV966 another very popular tube from uh, World War Two, 3 BPI there are a lot of these out there see a lot of those for sale they're a very good tube um, we have a couple of them working in our equipment at the moment with our demonstrators um, not a very big screen it's about two and three quarter inches still a little bit of a bowl shape there it'll run very nicely on about a thousand volts um, it's quite a large base again single electron gun for a, a single trace again um, we have one of these working uh, no, we have two of those working, beg your pardon. One of these is working in our chain home um, demonstrator, and we've just built one of these into the Würzburg um, Axis radar demonstrator as well. Here we have a World War II CV279. This is the last of our World War II tubes that we'll be showing. Um, I believe that a pair of these were used in an early AI radar system when the two are mounted in the box together. So as far as home projects are concerned, it's a 4 volt heater. The screen gives a nice brightish display, or bright display if you like, um, with just under a thousand volts. So it makes it sort of better for a home project if you're keeping that upper voltage down. It makes it a little bit safer. Um, base is the same with a lot of them. If you can't find the base, like I said before, then until you can actually find one, you could connect wires up. Um, you know, as long as you're careful how you do it. Um, then you know there we go there's there's nothing wrong with using a tube like this I certainly would recommend one if you have one or you're thinking of making a project and you can find a good one of those it'll give a good bright clear display uh, under a thousand volts 4 volt heater it's about a two and a half inch across the screen so in fact it's only slightly smaller than the 3 BPI which we just saw two very similar modern tubes here both Mullard tubes um, DG75 and this is a DG7131. Very similar. Some of the differences are sort of small differences between this sort of tube. There's a, we have a, a DG76 which we'll be using later on actually in this uh, 
demonstration. Uh, but the 7.5 and the 7.6, the difference is like I was explaining before. One has a symmetric um, X drive and the other is symmetrical. It depends whether or not you're going to use a differential driver or you're going to use a single end ended driver. You can use one for the other, but you'll end up with trapezium distortion if you're not careful, which may or may not affect what you're going to do if you're going to use it in the project. We're almost down to uh, valve holder sizes, you know, for conventional valves. This one, I believe, is the same as a an EF50 valve. So um, you can see it's interesting seeing how they become smaller. They're both single tube get sorry, single gun tubes as well. They're both around about to measure it. About two and three quarter inch tubes again. Ideal if you want a project at home, um, because you can have a good display on one of those for 800 volts. Obviously, take it up to a thousand and it's better, but you can't go over a thousand. These smaller tubes, these small modern tubes, are meant to be run with lower EHT. So you'll have a good display, a good sharp display with either of these with around about 800 volts. Here we have another similar tube to the DG76 we just saw. This is the 736, which is a lot longer but has a flat uh, face to the tube as you can see. Very similar to the um, 76 because it does much the same sort of job. Same connector as the 131. Unfortunately, on this particular example, as you can see, we've lost our label here. It's For some reason they do this, they break up. We can just about see the mullard and it's a D something. So by process of elimination working out, um, looking at other ones which we have, that's how we worked out it was a 736. Just for the record to finish off with, these are two tubes I would not recommend you buying. Or obtaining, or for that matter, if, if somebody gives it to you, it's a curiosity, I guess. Both of these require a set of coils to deflect the beam. Here in fact is a brand new set of coils which is the yoke. This will slide up the neck, it doesn't fit either of these so although this is new this wouldn't fit either of those so you'd need the proper coil set for either of those. Also this particular one is from a weather radar set which means it's a very very long persistent screen so this is a true radar screen that's not much use for anything else. Also great big final anode button on the side takes 20,000 volts. I think that would put me off using it and probably anybody else I guess. Um, where can you find 20,000 volts? Well yes. And this one probably has a very similar um, requirement for the final anode on that one. Um, as I say, they're nice curios but I very much doubt if we'll ever, ever find a use for those. Like this one wants to go running on its own. Stay there. Um, so there we go. So that, that really is what I would avoid buying or you know thinking you can use because quite honestly I very much doubt it would even think about trying to use either of those. That's all we're going to cover in part one of this video. If you wish to see how we go about putting a spot on a typical CRT then join us for part two. We'll obviously be then following this with moving the spot around the screen. Anyway thanks for watching.